What's coming up is free. There's a whole world of even better stuff for our Patreon supporters. Go to patreon.com slash word in your ear to see how you can join them. Welcome to another Word in Your Ear, and uh, this time we're talking to Michael Cragg, who's the author of Reach for the Stars, 1996 to 2006, Fame, Fallout, and Pop's Final Party. I must just to introduce it, um, I must just point out, when I received a copy of this book from the publisher, it, it had a very nice little note from the publisher saying, this might not be your thing musically, but I think you'll enjoy it. And you know, I very often get these these things saying you, you you don't like this kind of music, therefore you won't be interested in the story. Nothing could be further from the truth. Absolutely, the story is absolutely fascinating. And very often, the less you know about it, the more interesting the book is. You know, because there's an enormous amount of stuff covered in this in this uh, in this thick volume, which is a, in the shape of an oral history. And so, Michael, welcome. First Thank of all, can you can you kind of map out the kind of time scheme there? Why 1996? Why 2006? But for the fact, it's just tidy. <laughs> <laughs> well, initially it wasn't as tidy. So I knew I wanted to start in 96 because that's when, obviously, Take That had split up and kind of Britpop was sort of taking over. Pop was sort of in the doldrums slightly in this country. And then obviously a few months later, out of nowhere, the Spice Girls arrived with Wannabe and sort of, kick-started what follows you know pop was suddenly back shiny bright you know it was suddenly marketed towards younger people as well which kind of hadn't happened as much before or not in the intense way that they obviously did with them merchandise and everything was very sort of focused down to to young kids and sort of steps followed in that wake in s club seven and i thought well you know they kick-started that so it makes sense to start with them i didn't want to leave them out but my initial idea was to run the noughties, but how can you start in 2000 without mentioning the Spice Girls? So Right, of course. Yes. Then it got pushed back to 96. And then I thought, well, I can finish in 2009. But then it's like, well, why is it this weird sort of 14 year period? And so the very clever Peter Robinson of Pop Justice fame, when I interviewed him for the book, he was one of the first people. And he, he sort of was like, well, this doesn't really make sense. And he came up with the sort of 10 year thing purely because... We, we talked about it and we were like, well, Top of the Pops ended in 2006. Smash right. Hits closed okay. in 2006. That's right. Oh, well, that's a good thing. Yes. Yeah, Simon and McKinta left. Closed, didn't it? That's yeah, right. Pop World. They, they left Pop World. CD UK, SMTV, that was all changing around that time. So then it sort of felt like it made a bit more sense. And it was the end of an era, story. wasn't it? It was then. Yeah, the and the TV era. talent shows were sort of taking over, you know, the way like pop stars were even found and kind of all of that process was completely changing. So that was quite a neat way of, of doing it. So were, were you a, a fan or a student of this? I was, I used to buy Smash Hits magazine when I was young. I used to buy Top of the Pops. I used to buy Big, all of those kind of magazines. I sort of loved all of that. I loved the kind of way it was written. I loved the sort of humor around it. And I did like a lot of that stuff around that time. But as I got older, I sort of went to the dark side, to the other side. <laughs> and I got into like guitars and indie when I was at university. But my housemate at university would listen to a lot of this stuff. And I l still loved it. You know, I did. I would sort of hide that slightly, right. you know. There's I was going, to, I was going through some... You yeah. You're trying to wean yourself off the shiny yeah, I was, pop I was by was trying to make through... yourself like Radiohead and Indie and all that. And, and it failed, didn't it? I mean, Yeah, basically... it completely failed because as soon as I sort of became a journalist, I started working at Pop Justice. I wrote mainly about pop. I kind of only really write about pop. Not only, but like I enjoy writing about pop still now, obviously did this book. Um, so I couldn't keep it hidden for that long. But a lot of that was tied up in stuff I was going through as a person and, you know, trying to sort of hide who I was, my sexuality. It felt a lot easier to sort of, it felt like giving too much information away to sort of be into this kind of music, which is something that you sort of work through as you get older. But yeah, so I was, I was into it, but I would sort of keep it slightly hidden. Uh, I loved, yeah. and then I really, you know, there was a point where I talk about it in the book, you could say that you liked Girls Aloud and you could say that you liked Sugar Babes because 
they were in NME, they were being written about by so-called serious journalists because suddenly it was like made by Xenomania and, you know, it was done in this sort of interesting way and it had all these amazing references to sort of music that was okay to like, I guess. And it had guitars in it. <laughs> yeah. And Arctic Monkeys covered Love Machine and suddenly everyone yeah, was they like, were oh my God. Yeah. yeah, and so there were little bits of where I could sort of peek out and be like, oh, I like this too. And then as you get older, you're just like, I don't really care. Right. And obviously optimism and people writing about pop changed and people do sort of write about pop in a more serious way and they do take it slightly more seriously and they aren't as sort of afraid to say that they like it now so just, get, go on mark go no on. i just just wanted to ask uh just to get thing to, uh, talking about the spice girls there's a bit where christopher herbert i think it is her <laughs> former manager says something like uh that if you form a boy band only 50 percent of, of the audience are likely to be interested and if you form a girl band, 100%, because boys will buy records by girl bands, but boys will not buy records by boy bands. Would you agree with that? I guess I guess that was the sort of very surface level thinking was that girls fancy boys. And so girls would be drawn to a boy band and yeah. they wouldn't be drawn to a girl band, weirdly, because they would be jealous. There would be like this sort of jealousy thing there, or they would be like, they wouldn't necessarily, there was this weird thinking that they wouldn't necessarily buy music by a girl band and boys wouldn't be into boy yeah. bands and i can see it's not the coolest thing to say that you're into westlife as a young boy you know they try i think chris took that and he made five later on because i think he thought that a slightly more kind of lad band would have that bigger appeal where it wouldn't yeah. be as embarrassing to say that you liked a five song because there were elements of sort of hip-hop and it was slightly like harder edged on the spectrum of Westlife to five. But I think, you know, the, the thinking was that the Spice Girls would never work. You know, that in the book, we talk about how Smash It sort of ignored them. How, yes. Yeah, know, they did. They wouldn't let them perform in the office and all that's amazing. Well, the editor just didn't come out and they wouldn't put them in the magazine and they felt like the Blue Tones were where the magazine was headed. Like literally. <laughs> that's right. The Blue Tones. <laughs> <laughs> like the blue tones were on the cover before the Spice Girls. They were, you, so, you say is the kind of the the, the the beginning the beginning of the end of Smash Hits because they were kind of then slightly ostracised by Spice Girls. Yeah, and obviously Peter Lorraine at Top of the Pops magazine just sort of came in and was yeah, like, took them, "We're going to yeah. own yeah. if we can own this and it becomes as big as it became, then we can kind of get ahead." And they started selling more copies. Yeah. So why did, in your view, did, were the Spice Girls so enormous? Well, I just think. I mean, A, Wannabe is sort of this this kind of insane moment in time where if you listen to it now, it still doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It kind of, pop had kind of got quite static and sort of stayed. Like, Take That were great, but they had, even towards the end, they were moving into a more mature sort of back for good kind of vibe. And the Spice Girls were like, hang on, this is like female friendship. This is like having fun this is like being raucous it's what kids kind of imagined they would do if they got to run through like a hotel in the video they got to like have a food fight there was all this like fun and if it's sort of dysfunct if pop's meant to be dysfunctional like that's where that kind of came back i think and obviously they were also clever in their sort of marketing the lyrics to that song are very clever especially as we say to sort of get a female fan base to talk about friendship rather than like boys or yeah. love yes, or yes, heartbreak yes. yeah it's like if you're in a gang at school this is your anthem like this is your song and you know the guy who biff standard talks about it and it he sort of calls it like this punk record and it did have that sort of does have that kind of weird energy in it that sort of like it could fall apart at any moment i think they recorded it at 3 a.m or whatever or finished it like overnight and it's done quickly and it has this sort of unpolished feel to it which just felt exciting and was the one Spice Girl, do you think, that was in any way more integral to their success than any I think Jerry. I just don't think you can ignore Jerry. Oh, I mean, right, Jerry right. and Mel B were sort of the... I think Jerry just kind of epitomised that period of, like, just not letting anyone tell them that they couldn't do it. And I think that sort of fed into the song. Like, Wannabe, especially the video, everything about that wasn't meant to happen. They didn't want the video. They didn't want the song, the label. They tried to make it more R&B because that's kind of what they thought was selling. Jerry was like, no, we're not reshooting the video. I think she just drove it all forward. And also, like, I think she would 
be the first to say she's not like the best singer. She wasn't the best dancer, but she was like the best pop star, which isn't, you don't have to be those things necessarily. It's not always about that. It's about having that sort of secret edge, which later became the X Factor, I guess. But so, um, Yeah, so, so the thing that um, strikes me, goes through the whole book, is that... Um, this is a it's a different generation of pop stars, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, these, these were not bedroom dreamers, were they? These these were people who got out and did things. <clears throat> and one, one thing that that screams from every page is the fantastic ambition of people. You know yeah. what I mean? They, they, hey, get, tell us a bit about who were they? What kind of people were they? You know, were they stage school kids or, you know, what kind of backgrounds did they come from, these people? I think what's great is that you do get like the full spectrum of that because the Spice Girls were made up of people who had been to auditions. They had some of them been to sort of drama school, but they had also done kind of butlins. You know, they had done those right. sort of like holiday yeah. clubs, as had steps. You know, H was a sort of red coat or whatever. And so they had this mix of like, some of them were trying to sort of sidestep from stage school into pop stardom, which kind of makes sense. But others, you know, that's not what they were doing. They were just looking for a job and they were looking in the stage and they were sort of trying to figure it out that way. But then you have someone like the Sugar Babes who were 14, just mates at school. A friend of a friend knew like a manager. He heard one of them sing. They were brought into a studio at that age and suddenly the manager was like, you're the sugar babes. And so they were sort of ambitious in that they wanted to make music together and sing and that's what they loved doing. But they didn't want to be, they didn't necessarily want to be in a girl band. It sort of happened around them and they were just sort of from normal kind of working class families who just had a friend who sort of knew a friend. And then you have someone like S Club 7 who obviously were much more... I think a lot of them were stage school or yeah. sort of certainly more than, I mean, Joe tells an amazing story of just working in like a sort of restaurant where as soon as someone puts someone yes. on a song, she has to get up and sing. You know, yeah. She wasn't sort of from that world. She was just someone that had a really good voice and got sort of discovered. And Bradley was working in Chessington Wild Adventures and had been auditioning, but wasn't like in a world where it was easy for him to sort of, no. not work and then hopefully land but if you'd been to loads of auditions you were you become unembarrassable don't you because yeah you, you've dealt with humiliation and rejection from a quite an early age which most people don't yeah. so it, it makes these people really bulletproof doesn't it you know yeah because that was the thing about the spice girls you know talking about they come into the smash hits office they wanted to mime to their single didn't they or sing yeah. Or yeah. in the office that was yeah. inconceivable. Nobody would have done that. No, and they wanted to sit on people's laps and do <laughs> dances for them. And they wanted to show who they were. And 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 I think they did already have that. It wasn't like, I think obviously later on, S Club 7 would go in and do the same thing because Simon Fuller had done it before, but it wasn't the same. Like the Spice Girls, I think you couldn't stop them from doing those things if you wanted to. If they wanted to run right in your office, then that's what they would do. But yeah, like... I mean, the things that you'd have to do in an audition, I think in the five chapter, they talk about having to sort of suddenly dance to just a song, not even like singing along to it, yeah. just literally stand there and dance. And as much as they talk about how embarrassing it was, I'm sure that wasn't the first they time did they'd it. done they it. They did, done, it. They did yeah. it. Yeah, and Russell Brand was there, and he can never say that that's not true because, you know, he was there too. He tried to get into five. Oh, really? Did yeah. He? <laughs> yeah, he one of one of the members of Five was like Russell Brown was there. He sort of says it's not true now, but he was. Oh right, that's extraordinary. <laughs> it's so because it's this circuit, I guess it's you know Blue would often be the members of Blue would often be in auditions with sort of Will Young, who was trying to get into a boy band early on. You know that it was this sort of like if you didn't make it into one, you would try and get into another one. And I think that's that's quite. I don't know, it's quite pure in a way. Like, they just wanted to get into a band. They wanted this to sort of happen in one way or another. Actually, if we're talking about Blue, there are two fantastic stories in the book, which you should you should just tell both of them. They're so good. One's the Donatella Versace thing, <laughs> and then the other is the story of, uh, of the 9-11 controversy, which would be really interesting to discuss. But just tell us the Donatella Versace story for people who don't know. It's amazing. Yeah, so she wanted uh, her favourite band, her favourite British band, to come and appear or just to come to her show in Italy on in fashion week. And so she invited who she thought was her favorite band 
and off they came. They went and got dressed up. They brought over in a private jet when they flew. Brought over in a private jet. They got to like wear Versace clothes. They were all stood in a line and she obviously came along and was introduced to who she thought was her favourite band. And they all were like, well, that's weird. She was quite sort of off with us. That's strange. (laughs) And so this is Blue. And Blue were like, oh my God, how exciting. Like, this is amazing. And then obviously she wanted Blur (laughs) and had asked for Blur. But somewhere along the line, it had become Blue. And so she got blue when she wanted blur and i think years later so we're not blaming her for this we're not blaming her necessarily i think there was a a loss of communication breakdown in communication but um years later i think she tagged anthony or anthony costa from blue into something saying because i think it's obviously got picked up in this sort of you know nostalgia obviously but there was like an anniversary of it and it got picked up by a sort of instagram account and she added him in and sort of laughed about it because i think it's very funny but they were very excited and they couldn't understand why she didn't recognize them when she came down the line and was just sort of staring at them like, this isn't Damon Albarn. Like, where's Damon Albarn? Um, so, yeah, that's a funny story. But the 9-11 thing was the question, was it Lee Ryan who made this flip comment? Yeah. Just tell us about that because that's really interesting because in the, in the age of social media, this would have been, I think, the end of the group. But uh, Yeah, 100%. It. it would have been. And obviously in America, it, it was. They were... I think they were literally just starting to sort of go to America and it did end it there. But so they had filmed the video for their third single, If You Come Back, in New York on the day, on September the 11th. So they were standing in Brooklyn filming when it happened. And I think the first plane going into the tower, they sort of saw that happen. And so everyone was obviously hysterical. They couldn't use their phones. They got taken to uh, Tarrytown, I think it is which is sort of further away, obviously. And Atomic Kitten, who they were on their label with, were also filming a video. I think they were about to start, like, the next day. So they were in this place together. Obviously, you know, they didn't know what was going on. They couldn't contact their families. They then shot the video, I think. Or they had, no, they had to come back, I think. They came back maybe, like, two weeks later, straight into going to, like, do a show straight off the plane, straight into like press, straight into everything. And then maybe a few days later, they went, they got taken to the sun. And this was in a, the early days, obviously, of the internet. So they were doing a sort of live Q&A online. And their press person didn't know that this was happening. So they got asked about it because obviously it had just happened and everyone was talking about it, you know. And they knew, I think, that they had been in New York. So they were asking them lots and lots of questions. And Lee said what he said which was i can't remember exactly but it was along the lines of like why are we talking about this so much you know when elephants are dying around the world yeah that's right i know and you know so then that that happened and obviously everyone was hysterical and they had to try and put the various fires out and you know hugh goldsmith who is who ran that label was trying you know was in a pub on holiday like in the middle of nowhere and had to set up a sort of like emergency room of trying to get people to just sort of not run it but obviously there's a lot of talk of kind of war rooms and things like this because a huge amount of uh, energy is put into kind of dealing with the press and the media well i wanted to ask you uh, one of the things that struck me when reading it i thought what's the name of chris morris's film was it four lions or whatever Yeah. Yeah. yeah and i thought chris morris ought to make a film of this you know what i mean (laughs) And, and you thought, is it is it a tragedy or is it a comedy? You know, because it, it, there's definitely farcical elements mm. and there's tra- definitely tragical elements. And one of the things that strikes me all the way through the book is that people are really, everybody you talk to <clears throat> is kind of really needy and, and not afraid to tell you they're needy. You know what I mean? They yeah. tell you how heartbreaking this was. Because kind of triumph and disaster was built into it, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and you knew you knew that it was short term. You knew that it was sort of the ups and downs of it were just kind of part of it, I think. And they obviously, they didn't know. I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask them a lot was, did, did you know what you were signing? Like, how much money were you making? Like, did you know what these contracts meant? Because obviously they were only young. They were like 19, 20, yeah. a lot of them, or maybe even younger. And the amount of times they'd have to get their parents to read it and sign it because they weren't old enough. And I think you're right. Like there is a, everyone that wants to be famous or a pop star has a certain neediness there because they want to be 
But it's at. astonishing that they, there's a bit about five where they're living in this massive house and they're renting all these, all these limousines and all that without mm. realising that they're paying for it. You know, And yeah. this has happened decade in, decade out in the history yeah. of pop music, that, that there's some gullible bunch of kids will say, get it signed up to a deal that's completely yeah. draining them. I can't what believe I thought, that still happens. What I thought managers. was really interesting was the step story is, is slightly different they're very aware, even back then, of what they're spending. They didn't really want to go on tour with Britney Spears in America because they knew it would cost them money. They knew the money was coming out of their budget. I think because they were a tiny bit older and they'd had jobs before and they'd kind of been yeah. in this industry a yeah. tiny bit. And even that very small amount of experience, I think, had given them what they needed to just think, hang on. Whereas everyone else, quite rightly, in a way, you're 18, you've been you're like oh you can live in this five bedroom house with your bandmates you're it's like uni but you're gonna it's free basically <laughs> yeah, yeah and then it's not free you know and then it can be taken away within like a week if they get dropped it's like you they, have to that's, yeah. i was saying to mark last night that the word that is used throughout this book more than any other word is the word dropped yeah when we were dropped we were about to be dropped so because the deal was, they, all these things had to be financed by somebody, didn't they? And it was record companies, really. Post Spice Girls, they all thought, all right, we we'll put a couple of million pounds into this mm. act. And, and it would cost that much, wouldn't it, for yeah. videos, making the record, all that kind of thing. But they were, they were sort of like contract players in the 1930s in the movies, which was... <laughs> You know, if you did, if they didn't like you anymore, you were just put on the sidelines, weren't you? They, yeah. they had no power. Yeah, and also they were often at that age. You know, Will Young had gone to university, and he was one of the only few people that had experienced actual university. But for a lot of them, this was their university time. Right. So they were like, "This is where we have all of this fun, and we live in this house." But obviously, there was a point where that could just be taken away completely. But for them, they had kind of moved out of home, so they didn't want to then go back home they didn't want to like go backwards and so a few of them would then be like well I'm going to go and start my life now and move in with a friend and I'm not going to be you know I can't go backwards but for some of them they did have to make that what must have been incredibly embarrassing sort of backwards step and then you're not famous anymore you're not Lee from 911 you're not you know Lee from Steps or whatever you are now I used to be in a band. I used to be in a boy band. And I especially felt so if you're. Much sympathy for them. You know, there's, yeah, a bit, there's a bit where you I talk think... about McFly couldn't go to football matches unless they took security with them. Because yeah, and they people got would see them and, they, they, yeah. and they would be beaten up and attacked for being members of McFly. Well, or that... they couldn't go to like, you couldn't go, especially I think with Busted and McFly, where they did like those bands. They did like yeah. guitar bands. They did like the bands that were being written about in Enemy. But if they went to the gigs, they would get names thrown at them and they get called all sorts or they'd be written about in those publications yeah. in a way that was sort of no i really not. felt it was a tough life and also we should talk about the money side of it because very few of those people appeared to be in a position where they could make a large amount of money because they weren't part of the songwriting team yeah so, exactly so you don't have that revenue stream that people have more now even in pop where they are involved in the songwriting because yeah songwriters were writing songs for simon cowell or for simon fuller they weren't writing them for the pop stars necessarily you know right. they didn't they're interchangeable in that way if if one song can't go here then they could give it to someone else and you know Savan Katecha who's an incredibly successful songwriter now he said he would just write songs for Simon Cowell's taste like he knew what Simon Cowell wanted when he was making a Westlife I album see. yeah and so he would write with him in mind not with Westlife in mind and not with what maybe Westlife now like as they got older what they were kind of into or the fact that they maybe didn't want to sing ballads anymore it's like well Simon wants ballads for your right. album because that's what makes a lot of money on the basis of your, uh, your when you wanted to be an indie kid mm. uh, d did you ever subsequently find any of your indie heroes turning up amongst the songwriting teams of some kind of unlikely pop star you know well there's obviously andy mccluskey formerly of orchestral mm. maneuvers who was yeah i mean very I successful wasn't he yeah and johnny ma i remember like johnny ma is on the last girls allowed album and obviously uh he plays guitar on a couple of the tracks and obviously neil tennant and chris lowe uh wrote uh the loving kind which is on they wrote it for their album while they were working with Xenomania, but right. it ended up a Girls Aloud single. So there were like, there were little moments like that where you were like, oh, 
I, th- I think especially with Girls Aloud, especially with Xenomania, because that's almost like a Brian was Brian Higgins was reacting against what was happening. He hated everything that was happening with the sort of manufactured pop, with the kind of Swedish sound. So he was, I'm going to pull from like my influences of like New Order and the Smiths and, right. you know, I'm going to bring in members of like KLF's touring band to play on this Girls Aloud song. And it's like those things aren't supposed to happen in that way. And everything I think that they did was the opposite of what was going on at the time. And I think, you know, I love, I think those songs are absolutely incredible, but it was a way in for some people who were dismissive of what had come before. It was pop that's okay to like because there were guitars involved. Um, and it's so perilous, isn't it? The Andy McCluskey section talking about Atomic Kitten, I thought was riveting. You mm. know, where he, his, suddenly his own music is, is not fashionable anymore. It's all kind of grunge mm. and indie. And so he decides, on the advice of a member of Craftwork, to write electronic songs and invent a group to, to perform them. And then there's the whole business of the, of the single. Was it Hole, Hole Again? Yeah. And where it, it, they're about to be dropped and then the thing flops and then they were offered a chance to, I think Celine Dion wanted to record it and Britney Spears wanted to record it and they yeah. didn't let them. And yet still they somehow managed to get a hit. I mean, the whole thing is just so up and down, isn't it? And even within that, like you forget that people would release albums in other countries before they'd release them here. So Hole Again, if you ever get the version of that album that came out in Japan, Hole Again is completely, it's all spoken word with hardly any, with just the chorus. <laughs> so Kerry does nearly all of the song and then the chorus comes in. Yeah, And someone was like, that song is great, but that, that can't be the version that we release. So we need to sort of redo it for when the album comes out in the UK. So Hole Again itself almost didn't exist in the in the way that it did. And that obviously saved their career. And I think they were a bit skeptical of the spoken word because Never Ever was really big, like All Saints. And that obviously had that spoken word intro. So there were all these things at play that almost meant that they never really made it. And they had to put a lot of money into that band to kind of make that work and Hole Again sort of saved them, really. And then obviously, just as it was becoming a hit, Terry leaves the band. So you always need to be ready with like a replacement as well. Like the Sugar Babes later on, it was constantly like the brand has to continue regardless of whether the players are the same. You know, the brand of Sugar Babes, the brand of Atomic Kitten, let's just replace the members and move on, which is what they had to do very quickly. When One of the things that struck me is that um, it's not just the story of music, it's the story of media this this book mm. in that you know it goes through it starts in the kind of smash hits era doesn't it and then it's the heat era mm. and then subsequently it's the tv era isn't it and then it's the internet yeah. era i suppose and uh, <clears throat> so a lot of the latter half of the book is uh, it, you know is x factor and uh, and and so forth and i want to ask you television kind of takes over at this point doesn't it really yeah yeah, and what do you think is most? Which is the most cynical business, the music business or the television business? I mean, in the context of this, I think the TV section. I don't. Wanna, I don't want to say that it takes the fun out of it because I want people to read the second half of the book. But I do think, like, once the TV stuff started to come in and that that TV talent show world started, I think that's when some of the joy started to come out of the whole. That's process. really interesting. Why? Why do you think that? Because I agreed with you. I, it's just literally this conveyor belt that you can see, and I think even yeah. before that, it was behind the scenes, and we weren't sort of privy to everything and every yeah. sort of. And also, people need to be nurtured you know they need to have time before this starts like almost all of those bands maybe aside from sort of s club seven had had some sort of not huge struggle but they had had to sort of hone what they were doing they had had to fight for songs they had to sort of work out who they were in within this like mechanism and you don't get that on tv talent shows you're presented as is and actually as is is what they want they don't necessarily want you you have to balance out being polished, but also being like real. You can't be who you are in the first audition and then suddenly come back as a completely different person because that doesn't work for like the audience who are primed to sort of yeah, look at via real Yeah, TV, people. you knew so much about, I mean, like Hearsay were kind of created to on TV, really, and, as, as in yeah. S Club 7. You, and you kind of knew everything there was to know about these groups. There was no sense of mystery. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I think there's an amazing story that sort of sums it up, which is... Um, 
one of hearsay, whose name I suddenly can't remember. Oh, come on, Michael, you can do this. <laughs> one of hearsay, one of the women in hearsay that isn't Mylene and Kim. Oh, so annoying. Um, she sort of had short hair when she was in the audition stage. And then when they sort of were revealed as the band, she had long hair, which was obviously just extensions. And everyone was like, there was a bit of like, oh, who do you think you are? You know, like, how dare you sort of like have this glow up? Like, and it's like, well, that's, isn't that the point? Like, isn't the point of pop to sort of, before that was to turn sort of normal people into pop stars to sort yeah. of have this like, I'm a pop star now. Like I'm wearing yeah. this ridiculous yeah. outfit. I'm in this crazy world. I'm singing, you know, that was the whole point. But people, especially with Hearsay, I think, Hearsay is such an interesting, because people forget that wasn't a live TV show. We didn't vote. There was no public interaction. It was like a documentary that had already been filmed. The only sort of live element was when they revealed who the final five were. But we didn't vote on them. But in the book, they say that people thought that they had. They remember that they had. And also, I think at the time, what you had was this weird sense of like, because we weren't involved, we felt like they were above their station somehow, that they had got this kind of competition. They'd won this competition, but actually, like, we weren't really involved. And so they were sort of torn down very quickly. They went from selling, having the biggest selling debut single of all time to sort of their second album, not making the top 20, to being, like, attacked in the street, to splitting up. <laughs> you know, and that Terrible. took 15 months, maybe. Yeah. And that's, so that's crazy. And then yeah. you sort of have this kind of splinter group, Liberty X, who actually had much more time to work out who they wanted to be. They didn't want to work with Pete Waterman. They didn't want to be in that sort of world. They wanted to do sort of garage. They wanted to do R&B. And so they had a bit more time and then they became ultimately much more successful. So why, you know, is it all over? You know, what do you say? Pop's final party in the, in the kind of yeah. line of the book. Why Pop's final party? Why, what? It just felt like, I mean, nowadays, like the charts, the charts are so complicated. No one really understands them. It's really sort of convoluted. People aren't really having, I mean, people are having hits. I don't want to sound like, no, no, you know, but you know what I mean? Like you could be in a But bag. you go down the road, would people know what the number one record in the UK yeah, is? Yeah, because the charts are so, you know, streaming has sort of changed everything and the internet has, you know, social media has changed everything for pop stars. I feel like this was a period where they were having a lot of fun. Like I, I hope that comes across in the book that there were hugely fun things that they were oh, doing. Yeah. They were doing magazine yeah. shoots, TV stuff. There were like road shows, there were festivals. There was all this stuff to do. They were all big in sort of Germany. They were going to Japan. Like they were doing all of that. And obviously that's kind of, that's like sort of five level, you know, or even a band like All Stars, they were big in like other countries. And now I think you either have to be sort of Dua Lipa or that's kind of it, you know, to, to sort of live that kind of full fun pop star life now. And obviously social media has put a huge amount of pressure on people. It's put a pressure on people to sort of talk about specific things, to sort of... Yeah. In one way, it's great that people are talking about mental health and things more now. And obviously, like in this book, you wish that there were those conversations happening, especially with, you know, people, Sean from Five and Siobhan when she was in The Sugar Babes and things. But I feel like also now there is... Those conversations do happen and they are sort of not forced, but they are sort of expected to talk about a lot of things that maybe That's right. they don't always want to sort of talk about. And there's like a heaviness around some pop now, I think, which... Maybe, you can't be... Fri it's very difficult to be frivolous any longer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, and they it's very believe. hard because somebody is waiting in the wings to, to accuse yeah. you of taking something lightly that you really shouldn't take like In the context I mean, that all the other terrible things. pop music for, for yeah. years was, you can say what you like. This is yeah. a little playpen. It's not like real life at all. Yeah, and you can have fun. You can sort of have like little beefs with people in magazines yeah, yeah. and answer yeah, that yeah. silly question. But I guess also <clears throat> the problem with this period was it, it did become a prison. So it was hard for yeah, them to sure. come out of, you know, A1, for example, they sort of <clears throat> were trapped in this kind of boy band, curtains, covers, kind of like glossy thing. And they did try to break out of it with that third album, which has some really great moments and is produced by someone who had done sort of Travis and those kind of bands and Caught in the Middle is amazing as a song, but people weren't as interested because it wasn't what they wanted from them. And they, as they got older, a lot of these acts tried to kind of change, but they couldn't because this 
maybe this fun kind of frivolous thing had become a prison around them, really. It also isn't some of the the the, the, the interest in it in the fact that they're all groups. I mean, you're virtually yeah, I was going to say everybody's yeah. a group now. I looked to the charts the other day. It's, it's all solo. Group. It's all yeah. solo acts. So once yeah. there's a group, there's the internal dynamic there's of that absolutely. group. Absolutely. And who your favourite is and who your favourite isn't. You know. Yeah. And, that's and I think gone, because of the amount of magazines as well. Yeah, you could have a favourite. You could have magazines could just pluck one out of a band. There'd always be someone available. You know, you'd have yeah. sort of seven in S Club Seven. You'd could yeah. mix the girls from S Club 7 with the girls from Steps and you could make a cover out of that. And you, I think they just thought like the more people involved, the more fans they'd have, the more there's one for everyone. There's sort of someone that everyone can like. But yeah, I did struggle because I did interview solo people, but it was like, well, how do they fit in to the sort of, because they almost existed yeah. separately and there weren't that many of them, you know, or they had come from a band, you know, Rachel it's Stevens had. It's a completely had, different kind of story. Yeah, Rachel Stevens did have solo stuff, but obviously she came from S Club 7 and yeah. the Spice Girls each had solo stuff, but there weren't, you know, Craig David was sort of one of the few, like, huge solo stars. From Craig David, whose career is destroyed so cruelly and so instantly, virtually overnight yeah. by Bo Selector, I can't think of anybody falling out of favour so fast. It's just a pull. Yeah, I mean, it was a mix of things as well. Like, I tried to get across in the book how weird people were about Britain and America in this sort of, like... I just remember so many times people accusing British pop stars of becoming too American. There was this real sort of like separation. And I think Craig, because he was big in America with that first album, he did slightly tip into that, like that second album. I mean, A, it's called What's Your... F no, the single's called What's Your Flavor. Like not a great song to come back with, but also a super glossy video, very like Americanized, very sort of like using the lingo of sort of what people thought kind of Americans... You, you, so there was this distrust, I think, then, and I think that also didn't help. So once that had started to slip, I think the Bo Selector thing chimed with that and yeah. sort of solidified around it. And I think for a long time, people just thought the two were sort of enmeshed together. And That's right. luckily, like, he did have a career renaissance because he's obviously incredibly talented. Well, it's an extraordinary story. Uh, it's... Uh... And you, you know, I, I can, I can only, you know, go back to the point I made at the beginning. It's nothing to do with whether you happen to like the music or not, and I'm sure a lot of people do. But, but it is, it's genuinely a, a you know, a huge historical period, you know, which tells you a lot about about not just music, but about the media world and culture. how the world changed and, and media and and we all changed during that yeah. during that period of time, and. Uh, and I really think you should recommend it to Chris Morris. I think. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Four <laughs> lines <laughs> is the way to go. I'll, I'll let you have that idea for nothing. <laughs> Thank so you so much. <laughs> and all the very best with it, Michael. Oh, thank I'm you. Great to talk to you.